Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Okay, hadith number one from the last page. I'm just going to do them as I read them. Uh, the first hadith basically means don't mistreat them. <clears throat> now you have to remember that, uh, like we discussed before, slavery is more of a cultural issue which was fused with the religion. And you'll find that with all religions. And you'll find that with modern day society, that slavery really hasn't gone away. And it's fused in with secularism. Uh, therefore, there's always been a d divide. And anybody who studies politics and uh, society and, and how things work, and, and even economics and things like that, uh, will we'll quickly realize that slavery has always been there in some shape or form, whether you call it slavery or not. Now, it's important for us to note here, um, because this is a voice message, it makes it, makes it easy for me to, to, to clarify, which is that the Islamic word of uh, uh, slavery is different to the Western definition as to what slavery is. And this is very important. <clears throat> In Islam, you're not allowed to capture somebody who is free and enslave them. And the best example of that, of how that is not al allowed, is Surah Yusuf itself. The boys, they had an issue with Yusuf. So they threw him down the well, and then he became a slave. That is precisely the Western understanding of what slavery is. So you'd go into a particular country, you'd uh, perhaps colonize them or uh, have some kind of power over them, and you would steal, literally, uh, human beings, and you would make them into commodities. That is absolutely categorically disallowed in Islam. And it's an actual fact, a major sin. <coughs> Slavery in Islam is basically when there are two opposing parties, there's uh, country A and country B, uh, reconciliation has failed, diplomatic measures have failed, ties have failed. It could be that they've got a tie or, or a treaty and that's been broken, just like what happened with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, etc. And country A will then fight country B, irrespective of whether country A or B is Muslim or non-Muslim. They could be both Muslim, as we have seen at the time of Ali Muawiyah, etc. And they could be both non-Muslim, or it could be one Muslim and one non-Muslim. It's absolutely irrelevant, the religion. We're talking, again, culture, politics, fused in with religion. We have to, we have to understand that, that this is not a purely religious issue which a lot of people have an issue with when it comes to Islam that it becomes a religious obligation or recommendation in the, in, in the religion that you enslave and that you have sex slaves and that you uh, uh, become autocratic uh, and that you dominate and that it's a, a misogynistic religion uh, and that uh, there is a heavy emphasis on male uh, pleasure being fulfilled, etc. It doesn't even make sense. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Aisha and said, all we used to eat uh, were water and dates. And there were not two or three nights, except that we didn't even have a full meal. And it could be sometimes three new moons go by, meaning three months go by, and we've not even had any cooked meals in our house. How can it be possible that this man was a man who wanted to uh, assert himself and assert wealth and, and gain dominance for himself etc when he didn't even have his basic human needs fulfilled because of the fact that he was a prophet and this is what prophets do uh, he wouldn't sleep uh, on a normal mattress uh, in actual fact his mattress used to leave marks on his body and on one occasion they created an extra layer extra four layers on his mattress. So he's got a very basic mattress. Now again, a mattress could just be a sheet according to today's standards. Uh, so they, what they did is topped it up. <coughs> Excuse me. And the Prophet said, I don't want that. <coughs> Retire it to how it was with a basic layer. And that would leave marks on his back. So if there's a person like that, <coughs> how is it conceivable that a person can then claim that this person uh, you know, was whoever he's, they say he was, a warlord, etc. Uh, you have to give it justice and look at who he was from all aspects. And this is not being me biased, this is me uh, being academically honest. Slavery in Islam is when there are two opposing parties and one party loses. Again, irrespective of whether the loser is Muslim or not Muslim. What do we do with those captives? Do we kill them? 
do we imprison them? There's no system that existed at that time which would allow mass imprisonment. Or do we allow them to live within society, contributing to their economics, just like what the Prophet did with Khaybar. He, uh, after Khaybar contradicted many treaties, treaties after treaties, uh, he said that this is your final straw. And what he did, look at the incident here as well. He sends Ali ibn Abi Talib to Khaybar with a letter to say, listen, this is your last chance, so to speak. This is an ultimatum. Either we enter into treaty again, or you enter into Islam, or there is a war. And this is seven years plus of diplomacy, seven years plus of them being treacherous and, and trying to assassinate the Prophet. <clears throat> After seven years of him trying to be patient with them, he didn't imprison them, he didn't kill them, he let them live. And he said, you know what, you're going to keep your society as the way it is. He could have easily killed them all. And this is despite the fact that these people were sworn and proven enemies. And they made several attempts to take his life. The Prophet ﷺ forgave them. And he allowed them to carry on living as normal. And he said, okay, well, you can keep your city, you can keep your economics. You can keep your finances. Because Khaybar at that time was extremely wealthy. And he said, what we will do is we will become the government and oversee the dealings in Khaybar. That's the only thing that will change. And the Prophet ﷺ, even the time of Abu Bakr, and then later even Umar, they continued with this arrangement. Therefore, slavery in Islam is not to kill, is not to have some kind of sexual urges, desired uh, urges to be fulfilled. It's nothing to do with that. Slavery in Islam can only come about when there is a, a prisoner of war and you don't know what, you, what to do with him. You can't imprison him, you don't want to kill him. You let him live. And there are certain criteria as well. I mean, this is now going to the fiqhi aspect of it. If a person, if the law, if the war has been concluded and the ruler, the Muslim ruler, has now captured all of these prisoners of war, what he then does is say, listen, we've got a hundred prisoners of war. Is there anybody that wants to take one in or two in or three in? Similar to having refugees and asylum seekers now. Is there anybody that can help look after these people in their own home? But the Prophet ﷺ made it clear that if you are going to take in a captive, a prisoner of war, I'm not even going to use the, the word slavery because in Arabic the linguistic word is slavery, but that's not the actual definition according to our standards in the West. If you were to take a prisoner of war, you have to feed him like you feed yourself. You have to clothe him like you clothe yourself. You cannot burden him with more than that he can bear. And if he wants to get a job so that he can pay off his own ransom, then you must be uh, allowing him to do that. And if you let him free, uh, uh, you know, emancipate him for, for no financial gain from yourself, then you will attain a great reward with Allah. And there are so many things that we can mention about that. But in this hadith here, this is part of what we were just mentioning here about the rights and the and and and, and the ahkam and the, and the rulings, which is that if a man has a female slave, uh, he is allowed to have relations with her, uh, on the condition that there is mutual consent. Now in this hadith, it basically says, do not have intimacy with her and then treat her badly in the morning because she's your slave, and it becomes easy for you to lose that kind of connection. You could just treat her like a piece of meat, she's not your wife, because the wife has implications uh, on the marriage, etc. But if uh, there is a slave woman, you can be with her in the night, and then by the day you can treat her like a slave again. The Prophet Sallam said, don't do that. And if you do have a child together, then the child is attributed to the father, and automatically, this is what is known in the ahkam as Um Walad, she will automatically become free and the child will become free. She will automatically become free and the child will become free.